Hello guys, uh, let's start a new uh, lecture called Push Down Automata. So what's the objective of this lecture? We already know about two classes of the machines, DFAs and NFAs, and we are so familiar with them and we know their limitation. Now in this lecture, we are going to introduce a new class of automata and we expect, of course, that this new class should be more powerful. Fortunately, we already have a roadmap how to introduce a new class of automata. We are going to follow these eight steps. Let's see what we got for the first one. So why do we need a new class? As I said, DFA and NFAs have equal power and both of them just can recognize regular languages. That is a small portion of the languages as this uh, sketch is showing you. So why do we need a new class? Definitely we are looking for a more powerful class to be able to understand these kind of languages. Let me ask this question. What was missing in NFAs and DFAs that they could not recognize non-regular languages? Yeah, memory. Why I am saying this? Because, you know, we tested A to the N, B to the N, and we noticed that we need to have equal number of A's and B's. And then we concluded that, hey, how can I count the number of A's and then to make sure that number of B's is equal to that? So I would need a storage. I would need a mechanism for counting. And we need really a writable memory, right? If you ask me, hey, NFAs had memory, input tape. Yeah, that's kind of memory, but it is read-only memory, right? So we want to add some read-write memory to the NFAs and to create a new class of machine. The second step is to name this new class. What's the name? Since we are going to add some memory, as we said in the previous slide, and this memory is structured as a stack. That's why we generally call this new class as pushdown automata, abbreviated as PDA. Both deterministic and non-deterministic type of the PDAs exist, and we will define them in these lectures. And that's why we call them deterministic pushdown automata or DPDA and non-deterministic pushdown automata or NPDA. But when we are generally talking about them, we just prefer to refer them as only PDA. I am going to add a new note here. The number of states of PDAs is finite, but they decided not to use the, the word finite in the name. Yeah, that's fine. We, we just need to know that the number of states is finite. Okay, now let's talk about the PDA building blocks. PDAs have three main blocks. The input tape, the stack, and the control unit. And as usual, I remove the clock and the output part. Now let's uh, see each part in detail. The input tape, fortunately, is totally similar to the uh, DFAs and NFAs. And if you have any problem or you want to refresh your mind, just refer to the DFAs. The second part is the stack, which is a new part. The stack is bounded from one end, it is unbounded from the other end. So one more time, when we say unbounded, it doesn't mean infinite. It means that the string we put here can be as big as possible. 
So this is a theoretic mathematical model. Always remember this. This stack is divided into the cells and each cell can hold one symbol. And there is a stack pointer that always is pointing to the top of the stack. And also we have a special symbol called capital Z and we put it in the bottom of the stack. Actually, when you start your machine, this will be written on the bottom of the stack and it shows the bottom of the stack. So if you want to check whether we are out of the symbols in the stack, we check this. If it is Z, it means that the stack is empty. Now let's see how the stack work. As you know, a stack works based on the last in first out or LIFO manner. And there are only two basic operations for the stacks, pop and push. Even though these operations are very similar to whatever you learn in data structure course, but I want to make sure that we all are on the same page. Let's have a quick review about these two operations. Let's start with the pop, how pop works. So the stack pointer is pointing to the top of the stack. And for popping operation, this symbol that the stack pointer is pointing at will be sent to the uh, control unit. And if the control unit can consume this, then it really will be popped like this. And then the stack pointer will move down like this. And all of these operations happen during only one time frame. So how about push? The push is like this. The stack pointer moves one cell up and then we start pushing the string. What does it mean? Yeah, the push can push the entire string inside the stack and it starts from the rightmost symbols. So for example, if we want to push the CD, first D will be inserted and then C. Based on this mechanism, the D will be pushed like this and the stack pointer will move one cell up and then the C will be pushed. So one more time, if you have a string like A, B, C, this way they will push first C, then B, then A. Some notes about the stack. First thing that you need to know is the stack's alphabet can be totally different than the uh, regular alphabet. So the regular alphabet is sigma, as you know, let's say it, it is A and B, the alphabet of the stack that will show it and will be explained in a few minutes with gamma, it can be totally different. So let's say, for example, X and Y, or maybe more, right? For example, I don't know, D and S, something like that. Okay, so this is the first point that you need to know. And the second point is this Z at the bottom of the stack. If your algorithm needs, you can even pop this Z as well. Or even you can push many Z's inside the stack. It's totally your responsibility how you handle this Z. But, you know, make sure that you always have this Z at the bottom of the stack because that's the only way that we can check whether the stack is empty or not. Another point you need to know, JFLAP works in two modes, multiple character, single character. So we will be using multiple character. In this mode, we can push a string. But if you set the JFLAP in this mode, single character, then with every push, you 
can only push one symbol. So this guy is uh, much easier. So we will be using in multiple character. How control unit works? Control unit, like the other classes of machines that we learn, it has a transition graph, something like this. So this is just an example. So what is the difference here between this and NFAs and DFAs? Yeah, these labels looks different. Before we had only one character or one symbol like this, or in some cases we had lambda for the lambda transitions, but now we have three parts. And it is understandable because now we have a stack, we, we can pop and we can push. So this is the reason that this label looks a little bit more complex. Yeah, let's analyze them and see what parts we have. As you see, we have three parts here, right? From the left to right, we have C, which is the input symbol that should be read. This is similar DFAs and NFA, and it is whatever that we read from the uh, input tape. The second part is whatever will be popped from the stack. And the third part will be whatever that will be pushed into the stack. Okay, now our knowledge is enough. Let's uh, see how the PDAs work. In this section, we need to specify precisely four things. A starting configuration, what would happen during a time frame when machine halt and how the machine accept or reject a string. Let's start with the starting configuration. The clock you know, the imaginary clock, let's say, it starts always from the zero and the input tape is exactly like the DFAs. So the string will be written on the tape. The cursor starts pointing to the leftmost symbol. Initial state will be activated as usual. So up to this point, we're very similar to the DFAs, right? The only difference is the stack. All right. So the stack will be initialized with the special character that is the capital Z and the stack pointer points to it. What happens during a time frame? During a time frame, many tasks will happen and in combine, all of them are called transition. As you know, when the clock starts ticking, machine goes from one configuration to another configuration. And in each configuration, machine make a decision. So to visualize all of these stuff, let's uh, explain them through some examples. In these examples, we will see a partial transition graph, the input tape, a stack and a clock. In fact, we are at time frame N and we have a configuration for the machine. And the question is, what would be the configuration of the machine at time frame N plus one? Here is the configuration. The stack is pointing to K and these are the content of the stack. And these are the content of the input tape and Q2 is activated right now. The machine should make a decision based on what? Based on the input and the top of the stack. Okay, so this transition is saying that if the input is M, which is M, and if the top of the stack is K, which is, right, then consume this M, pop this K, and push this F. So in the next slide, we should see something like this. So the M should be consumed and this guy K should be popped. And instead of K, 
we need to see F because K will be popped and F will be pushed. So in the next slide, I should see F instead of the K. Yeah, that's what we predicted. So this is how the machine works. Okay, so roughly speaking, here is what happens. Why I am saying that this is rough summary? Because the precise one will come in a few minutes, right? A symbol at which the cursor is pointing is consumed. A symbol at which a stack pointer is pointing is popped. And a string will be pushed. And control unit makes its decision and makes its moves based on an if then a statement which we call it the logic of the transition okay so what is the logic of the transition before going further let me explain that so the, here is the if statement if the input symbol is b we are talking about this particular transition if the input symbol is b and if the top of the stack is y then consume B, so this guy will be consumed, pop the Y, this guy will be popped, and then push the whatever we have here, the XK here, will be pushed. And transit from QI to QJ. So I explained this through an example, but it is whatever happens during one time frame. If I ask this question, how does this machine looks like after this transition? Yeah, it's simple. So this guy will be consumed and the cursor will point to this. And this guy will be replaced with XK. And you remember that first K will be pushed and then X and the stack pointer will pointing to the x let's see so one question raises here is that what if the input is not b what would happen or even what if the top of the stack was not y then what what would happen yeah we need to get back to this question and we will respond to these two questions precisely later. Like other machines, we might have multiple labels here. It means that whichever that is satisfied, the machine moves from QI to the QJ. So between these two labels, there is an OR. Whichever is satisfied, then machine makes its move. Now we want to relax these operations. What does it mean? If we put lambda in any parts of that label, that part will be relaxed. What does it mean? It means that we, we can have no condition or no action. What does it mean? Yeah, I need to explain that through some examples, but please pay attention that this is the third usage of the lambda. You shouldn't confuse between these three usages, okay? So the first usage was the empty string, and then we use lambda for the lambda transition. Now we are using it for relaxing a condition or an operations. Yeah, let me take some examples. Okay, look at this transition. Instead of the input tape, we have lambda. It means that don't see or don't care about whatever the input symbol is. Here, it just look at the top of the stack. If it is A, then pop it and then push this guy. Okay, so all of these operations will happen again in one time frame. One more time, we put a lambda here. It means that don't check the input symbol at all. And when you don't check the input symbol, it means that you don't consume any input symbol at all. All 
All right. Next example. Now we put the lambda in the pop part. What does it mean? It means that check the input symbol. If it is A, don't care about the top of the stack, right? If the input symbol is A, then push this into the stack. So in this case, nothing will be popped. How about here? Yeah, now I think you can interpret this, that what does it mean? So here we are checking the input symbol. We are checking the top of the stack and then we don't push anything. It just moves from here to here. How about this? Yeah, in this example, we put lambda in two places, right? It means that don't care about the input symbol, just check the top of the stack. And if the top of the stack is A, pop it and move from Q2 to Q5. So in this case, no input symbol will be consumed at all and nothing will be pushed into the stack. Another example, here we put the lambda in two places, here on the top of the stack and here on the push side. So what does it mean? It means that just check the input symbol and don't do anything. Don't touch or don't look at the stack at all and move from Q2 to Q5 if the input symbol is C, really C. So this one is one of those interesting ones because it does not touch the stack at all. It just look at the input symbol. What does this remind you? Doesn't this look like a DFA or an FA? Yeah, it is. Okay, so we did not have NPDA so far. I mean, whatever we said so far under the PDAs are common for DPDAs and NPDAs. So far, we didn't talk about the lambda transition. Yeah, just one more time. When we see lambda here, it doesn't mean that we have lambda transition. Lambda transition has its own definition. Lambda transition, to refresh your mind, is when the machine unconditionally can transit, all right? So we will define that precisely. But before that, let's talk about what would happen during a time frame that we call it transition. Here are the tasks that will happen. Zero or one symbol at which cursor is pointing is consumed. Why I am saying zero? Because we may have lambda in that part. Okay. And the same thing for the top of the stack. So zero or one symbol at which the stack pointer is pointing is popped. So this zero again is if we have lambda in that part of the label. A string will be pushed, but this string can be empty if we have lambda in the push part. And the control unit makes its decision based on the logic that we explained before. Let's see more transition examples now. Okay, so what would happen here? If the input symbol is M, which is, and if the top of the stack is K, that is, then consume this M, pop this K, and push nothing. So in the next slide, we should see the M is consumed, and this guy will be popped, and the stack pointer will point to the D. Another example, if the input symbol is M, don't care about the top of the stack and push the F. So it means that we don't pop anything. So in the next slide, the F should be pushed and the stack pointer should point to the F and this M will be consumed. And of course, machine moves from Q2 to Q5. Another example, 
if the M is the input symbol, the K is the top of the stack, consume M, pop K and push FK. So the K will be popped, but then after that, FK will be pushed, which it returns back the K in its place. Now the question is, why did we do that? We could put lambda here, and instead of the FK, we could just say, hey, uh, push the F. Why did we do that? Yeah, in some cases, we really want to check the top of the stack, and we have to pop it after checking right now if we really need that data we push it again so this is the mechanism that we will uh, follow another example just look at the input symbol if it is m then don't touch the stack at all just consume m you see the stack is not touched at all okay this is important one. This example shows you the difference between the DFAs and PDAs. Look at the input tape. The input tape is out of the symbol. Does it mean that the machine should stop? The point is not. That's the difference between the, this machine and DFAs and NFAs. The input tape is out of symbol but we have a transition here that it's saying that don't check or don't care about the input symbol. Just check the top of the stack. If it is K, then pop it and then push the C, right? So in the next slide, the input tape won't be touched at all. And this K will be popped. And instead of that, the C will be pushed. Another example. So this is important because here for the first time, the condition for transition is not satisfied. So the machine is asking if the input is A, yeah, it is not A, then what? It means that we need to define a behavior here. If the input symbol is not whatever we expect, then we really need to define a behavior for that. So I'm sure that you agree the best behavior will be halting. The machine halts if the condition for transition is not satisfied. Another one, if the input symbol is M, is M. If the top of the stack is C, it is not. So this time another condition for transition is not satisfied so far you learn that we have two conditions for transition the input symbol and the top of the stack and that's why we separate them with comma and then we put semicolon here to separate the condition for transition and the operations which is here the push part again machine has to halt now our knowledge is enough to answer this question when pda is halt we learn through the examples that all input symbols are consumed is not sufficient for halting we would need to have another uh, condition which is zero transition. So machine halts when it has zero transition. That's the only reason that PDAs halt. So how about the accepting or rejecting the strings? So the accepting, we would need all of those standard three conditions. Machine should halt. Machine should consume all of the symbols and machine should stop in a final state. In that case, the machine accepts a string. As usual for rejecting a string, we just negate both sides and whichever comes first, because be between these guys are or, whichever comes first, then 
machine reject a string so either the machine does not halt or the all of the symbols are not consumed or machine is not in the final state in that case the machine will reject the string okay here we need to pay attention to some notes the final content of the stack is not important at all so we didn't mention anything about the content of the stack in fact the stack is acting like a scratch paper to store some middle computation results and it doesn't affect the accepting or rejecting any string and that's a very important point the second point is jflab has two modes again you can set it to accept a string if the stack is empty but we won't use this right we stick to whatever we said so far so accepting and rejecting is based on the three uh, you know, standard conditions that we just mentioned all right so now our knowledge is enough to see the pdas in the action let's start from the design examples and our first example is our famous language which is, which is uh, a to the n b to the n all right we already noticed that we could not create an nfa for this now let's see how easily we can design a machine to accept this a to the n b to the n first of all let me enumerate its string so it will be lambda a b a a b b and so forth so these are the strings all right how can i design a pda for that the best practice will be to take a very simple example and we design our code based on that example that is you know usually a happy example for example a a a b b b and the stack will start from here so we know that this is the uh, starting configuration all right okay so what's the strategy here i try to read all of the a's and push them into the stack and then when i reach to the first b i start popping the a's and matching them with the b's what does it mean okay let's see uh, first of all since uh, it needs to accept the lambda i create this initial state as the accepting state okay how can i read the a's and then push them in the stack very easy i would say if the input is a comma and don't care about the top of the stack semicolon and push the a into the stack what would happen after this transition the top of the the stack is z so after this we we are gonna push one a here and then the stack pointer will point to here what would happen to the input tape yeah this a will be consumed so and the cursor will point to, to this a after this transition I need to do the same for all of the A's. That's why I create a loop here and then I do the same thing. A comma lambda semicolon A. So after this loop, what would happen? After this loop, all of these A's will be pushed into the stack. So we have one a here one a here and our stack pointer will goes here and what would happen to the input tape this will be consumed this will be consumed and the cursor points to here so now we are here okay what would happen if we read the first b then we read and consume the b but we need to match every b's with one a 
to make sure that the number of A's and B's are equal, right? How can I do that? I would say if the input is B and if the top of the stack is A, then consume the B, pop the A, and don't push anything. Fantastic. What would happen after this transition? After this transition, this B will be consumed and this guy will be popped and the stack pointer will point to the second A from the top. Okay, I need to do the same thing for the rest of the A's in the stack and the rest of the B's in the input tape. So I put a loop here with the same label. If the input is B, consume it. The top of the stack should be A as well. Then don't push anything. Now tell me what would happen after this loop. Do you agree that all of these B's will be matched with all of these A's? And what would happen? The stack pointer will point here. And how about the input tape? The input tape will consume this and this, and the cursor will point to this empty cell. Okay, so this means that all of the A's and B's are equal. I mean, the number of A's and number of B's are equal, and everything is consumed. So do you agree that I need to accept it here, but I need to send it from here to here, how can I do that? I would say, hey, don't care about the input. And if the stack pointer is pointing to the Z, then pop it and uh, yeah, we'd better uh, to push it again. And the machine moves from here to here and will accept the string like this. Okay, fantastic. Does it really work? Yeah, we need to trace it and we need to think more about that. How about if number of A's are more than number of B's or the other way around? How about if the number of B's are more than A's, right? Or what if the string starts with B, for example? Let's say, for example, BA, right? This one is very easy. If this uh, string starts with BA, since we don't have any outgoing for the B, right? The machine stops here and will reject this string because all of the symbols are not consumed, right? So first, let me trace different situation that we may have. And then let's see what would happen. I explain everything here and I uh, put this material here for your reference. Now let's start tracing. So this is the same string AAA, BBB, and we want to trace it and see how the machine works. So this is the starting configuration. As you will see, the cursor is pointing to the leftmost symbol, the stack pre-installed the Z, capital Z, and the stack pointer is pointing to that, and the initial state is activated, and the clock is showing the zero. So what would happen in the next slide? The first A will be consumed because this condition is satisfied, and one A will be pushed into the stack, and this will continue with all of the A's and all of these A's will be pushed based on this transition. Now we reach to the first B. So this guy won't be activated anymore, but this transition will be activated because all of these conditions are satisfied. The input symbol is B, top of the stack is A, and the B will be consumed and the A will be popped from the stack. Let's see. You see? And the same thing would happen for the rest of the B's in the input tape and rest of the A's in the uh, stack. But 
this time this loop will be activated the last one okay now what now this guy won't be satisfied anymore but this guy will be right don't care about the input symbol if the top of the stack is z pop it and push it again right and move from q2 to q3 are all of the conditions for accepting this string satisfied let's investigate we are out of the symbol the machine stops and there is no more transition and also the machine halts in an accepting state so all of those three conditions are satisfied so definitely machine accepted the string okay another example now the number of a's is more than number of b's now let's see what would happen so definitely the first three a's will act exactly the same as in the previous uh, example we can move a little bit faster consume one a consume another one a and push all of those three a's into the stack now the first b will be sent it will be consumed right and it will be matched with one of these a's that was here it will be matched with another one now what is this satisfied no it, it it doesn't satisfy anymore because the input is not b is this satisfied let's see no because you know the top of the stack is not z so it means that the machine has to stop here right and since this is not an accepting state therefore the machine should reject this string another example now the number of b's are more than number of a's let's trace it and see what would happen the first two a's will be pushed to the stack and they will be matched with uh, two b's okay now it, this is the critical situation is this satisfied the input is b but the top of the stack is not a right so you agree that this transition won't be activated how about this one oh this this is the interesting one it is saying that don't care about the input top of the stack is z yes it is z right so this one will be activated but just notice that no b's are consumed here so in the next slide machine moves from q2 to q3 right and it popped the z and it push it again yeah we don't have any changes on, on the stack side but just remember that this b is not consumed so it means that one condition for accepting this string is not satisfied and what condition i am talking about consuming all of the symbols okay that's why this string will be rejected this is the flow chart how the pdas work so it starts from here and it always checks that is there any more transition and if there is yes here it will transit and then it asks again so if there is no transition then it goes to check whether all of the symbols are consumed in fact this part is checking whether the string should be accepted or rejected if the, all of the symbols are consumed and if the current state is accepting the state then the string will be accepted otherwise it should be rejected see you guys in the next lecture